now, just the south. Uh, he's the chief learning officer for the International Society for Technology and Education. Uh, prior to his work there at ISTE, he served as the director of the Office of Educational Technology at the U.S. Department of Education, where he advised the Secretary of Education and developed national educational technology policy, formed public-private partnerships to assist state and local education leaders in transitioning to digital learning, along with many other highly regarded accomplishments. Thanks. And everybody, you can see my screen. We're good. We can see your screen. Everything's All right. Great. I think that question has been asked about a half a million times a day right now. Um, so um, really excited to be here. Um, thanks for taking some time. Um, I really have limited time. 30 minutes is not very long. Um, so I'm going to focus my conversation today thinking about the fundamental value of higher education for the real needs of today's students and really talk in terms of principles and framing that we can use to think through these issues um, at a deeper level. Um, I also recognize that it's uh, various times of day for people around the world. So uh, whether it's a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, possibly good night. Um, and I hope that you'll, um, through your questions, bring in other perspectives as well. So, the, the thing I want to focus on this morning is what is the core value of higher education? If you just step back and said, what really are we trying to accomplish here? What is it that we provide that's unique to higher ed? And what relationships are at the center of this endeavor? So um, maybe be thinking about that um, to, to, to sort of illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, I want to go back to the Wright brothers. They're, they're fairly famous. Um, for bringing flight to uh, all of us. Um, they were in an environment when uh, they started where these were the kinds of contraptions that were being made um, by various inventors to fly. And as they came on the scene, uh, these were the kinds of attempts that, that were happening around them. And if you look at these uh, various designs, one thing that becomes uh, very clear is that they're all essentially uh, models of, of a bird in flight. And since uh, birds were the creatures that they knew that could fly, uh, people started building models that looked like birds. And essentially, they were taking a copy and paste approach to innovation and saying, we have, we have a bird model. We, it flaps its wings. It's got a large fan tail. Um, let's fly like a bird. Um, the 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 thing that the Wright brothers did that was so different and so innovative is rather than thinking in terms of copy and paste, they started thinking about what are the fundamental relationships. Um, and what they understood deeply that no other innovator did was that there's really three things that you need to do to control flight. You need to control the roll, the pitch, and the yaw. And if you can do that, then you can fly. And so they had this insight because they built bicycles. And a bicycle is an inherently unstable object. If you think about it, if you let go of a bike, it falls over. It is unstable. But you have a way to control that bike in three dimensions. And they were able to apply that knowledge. And so as a result, uh, they, they indeed succeeded. And the really interesting thing about this is those same fundamental principles, that same principles of controlled flight apply to every flying machine just about that has existed since then, regardless of its configuration. And so the question I wanna ask as we, as we enter a time when uh, higher education and teaching and learning is really changing rapidly and changing faster than we want it, um, we are, asking ourselves, what are the fundamental relationships of higher education? And so I'm going to, uh, to posit that there's three fundamental relationships that we need to pay attention to. Now I realize you may have a different answer to this, and, that, and that's great, but th this is my answer. Um, and these are the, so these are the three. The first is the expert and the learner together. So my whole educational, higher educational experience changed dramatically. Um, the day that I was sitting in class and I was so confused, that I decided I was gonna do something crazy that I'd never done before, that nobody had ever really told me I should do, 
is I went to office hours. Um, and lo and behold, much to the surprise of my professor, I showed up and he happened to be in his office and he sat down with me and he helped me through that. And I realized a secret. Um, it's sort of, you know, office hours is the fight club of higher education, right? The first rule of office hours is you don't talk about office hours, right? Um, what, I, what I discovered is that I could go and talk to my professors every, every week, and I did. And I developed relationships with each one of my professors, and I got one-on-one -on -one tutoring from them. And that one-on-one -on -one tutoring relationship, we know, as you're probably aware of the studies, it leads to a two sigma increase in learning. Um, so this is one of the fundamental relationships of higher education. It's an expert and a learner learning together um, in, a, in a very intensive relationship. The second one is learner to learner. Um, we know that a community of learners learned faster and more deeply than an individual learner. Um, and I think all of us have had this experience of learning with others and learning better. Now we've also learned with others and we've learned worse, right? So it's not like it's a, ma it's a magic bullet. You, you have to do it right, but it can be very, very powerful. And we have to remember that the value so again, I'm getting at the value. The value of higher education, in part, is the relationships that are formed between our students. And that may not be something that we think about when we're thinking about teaching and learning how valuable and important those relationships are. I was just reflecting that today I work for, I, I, my supervisor is a person I met in a class in college. Um, and so, you know, that relationship's had a profound impact on my life. And then the third is a learner being able to apply what they're learning. Um, and in particular, um, we know that application is a very powerful way of learning, but it's even more powerful when you have access to an expert who can correct your mistakes early on. So, so the, it, you need to apply it, you need to try it, you need to make some mistakes, but, the, but if those mistakes can be corrected by an expert, then learning happens much faster. Um, so, so the thought here is, these are the three fundamental relationships of, of higher education that make it powerful. How do we do that well? And, and the question is not, how do we do that well online? The question is, how do we do that well, period? How, how do we do that better face-to-face -face or in blended or in online environments? And to really answer that question, you have to answer the question of who are you doing it for? Who are you doing it with? Um, and so just picture in your mind, you know, what does today's college student look like? And a lot of us, when you close your eyes and conjure up a college student, this is what you see, right? Well, um, unfortunately, that's wrong. Um, that's not what today's college student looks like. A third of them are over 25, a third of them work full-time, a quarter of them are parents, and half of those are single parents. 30% um, are first-gen students. It's their first time going to college. They have no idea how to do it. They have no social capital to support them. And a quarter of students are that and low income. Um, so it's really um, important for us to step back and, and say, if this is the picture we have in our head of who we're serving, um, we need to change that. Um, this is actually an accurate picture of who we're serving. And in fact, only 30% of today's college students are both full-time students and of standard college age. Um, so 70% of, of, our, of our students um, meet this other demographic. And so now, now we need to ask ourselves this question, how do I maintain and enhance these relationships, the expert learner relationship, the learner learner relationship, and the learner application relationship when my students are working full time, when they're single parents, when they're low income, when they're first generation. And, you know, these, this demographic of students has needs that maybe we're not used to thinking about um, as much as we should. So this is um, an example of a student in these circumstances. This is Kayla. Um, Kayla is uh, rents an apartment with friends. She helps her father with her stepbrother. She works 30 hours a week and she is getting her prerequisites for uh, community college. And if you look at this circle, this is her 24 hour day and the orange slices are when she can study. 
So she can do it early in the morning when she wakes up. She can do it on the train to school. She does it a little bit between classes, during a work break, on the train to her parents, and then on the train home. That's it. That's what she has available. That's when she can study. That's when she can learn. And so, you know, for Kayla, higher education needs to be more flexible. It needs to work around her complicated work life. Um, and she needs to be able to reclaim the travel time of going to and from campus. That's very, very precious to her. Um, it needs to be more efficient. Um, it needs to take into account what she already knows and, and not have her spend any time learning things that she doesn't need to be learning because she just simply doesn't have time for that. Um, and it needs to be more affordable. Um, you know, one of my favorite quotes is from uh, Johnny Lazzarini, who says, when I look at a syllabus and it says required text, I think in my head, oh, that's adorable. Um, why is he thinking it's adorable? Because he knows he's not going to buy the text. And why isn't he going to buy the text? Because it's too expensive. Um, he's going to save that money. He's going to look for online resources. He's going to do anything he can because he needs that money for rent. And unfortunately, for more and more students, he may need that money for food. Um, food insecurity is a growing problem among uh, college-going students, and they are literally making these kinds of trade-offs. Um, the other thing that he needs is for higher education to be more relevant to the workplace. Now, I know that there's a huge debate about whether higher ed should just be job training, um, and I'm not talking about that kind of change, but when most recent college graduates say they need additional education or training to get the jobs that they want, um, that's troubling to me. Um, I was a liberal arts major. I, I was an English major. Um, I learned great critical thinking and analytical skills that have served me my entire life, have served me in every profession. My liberal arts education delivered for me. However, there was a time when it didn't, and that's when I graduated. And I was completely unprepared for the workplace. Um, I had to learn a new skill to get my first job. Um, I wasn't able to be employed full time because of because of my lack of training. Um, eventually I made it through by bootstrapping that. And after that, my, my, grad, my degree served me well, but we have to be better at making that bridge, right? That, that, that first step needs to not be off of a cliff. Um, so, so stepping back then, asking the question, if, if the real needs of today's students are more flexible, efficient, affordable, and workplace relevant environment, you know, how can we bring that to these three relationships? Um, and, you know, I think about um, uh, places we can get stuck. So, you know, the, the cinema has been around forever um, and it didn't change for a long, long time. Um, you could walk into a, a theater in uh, 1922 and walk into a theater in 1980 or even 2000, and, and it's about the same. Um, but you know, somebody came to disrupt that world. And if you recall, it was Blockbuster, right? They showed up and they said, we're gonna change all of this. We're gonna, we're gonna be more flexible, we're gonna be more efficient, we're gonna be more affordable, and we're gonna be more relevant. Well, they also sort of took a copy and paste approach, right? If you walked into these stores, you could buy you know, theater candy, um, literally. And so while they added some flexibility where there's not a specific start time for a movie, you still had to get in a car and go to a place. While they were more efficient if you knew what you wanted, how many of you spent more time choosing your movie at a Blockbuster than actually watching the movie that you got from Blockbuster? Um, they are more affordable, they're cheaper than a movie, but really only if you watch them in a group. And as far as relevance, yeah, sure, they had 200 choices, but how can I couldn't find the one that I wanted to watch, right? And so, so this is an example of innovation that because they took a copy and paste approach and innovated a little bit, they didn't get there all the way. But if you look at Netflix, you're seeing something completely different. Um, the flexibility is endless. You can watch it anytime. The efficiency, touch of a button. Affordability, unlimited consumption, all you can, all you can watch. Um, and the relevance is really interesting because in addition to essentially unlimited choices, they're now using artificial intelligence to help you find what you actually want to see. Um, so this is where we need to get to. We need to be thinking about this set of co design constraints, but going all the way in our innovation, not part of the way. Um, and just to, just to you know, think about a few possibilities here, 
And one of the things that's happened during COVID is, um, you know, I, there's a history professor who, when he made that switch to online, and he was finally, you know, on a Zoom call with his students, um, he found that his lectures were not going that well. But he also found that he, he just threw out there, he's like, hey, well, you know, I have office hours, and since we're all stuck at home, you might as well reach out. Well, some students started doing that, and then essentially his whole class started doing it. And then he started spending as much time teaching the students as off, in office hours as he did in the lectures. And he said that it transformed the experience for him and for his students. Um, so, so one thing that COVID has done is maybe it can open up a little bit um, how we think about connecting the experts with learners and being more flexible in doing so, which makes it more um, possible for learners to do it. Um, when it comes to learner to learner, um, you know, one thing that, that we've done um, at ISTE, we've, we combined with an organization called EdSurge, which is an amazing news organization. And we designed something called Loop. And this is a peer learning network. And the way it works is every week, you get to opt in to having a phone call that week for 30 minutes. And if you opt in, then we use an algorithm that looks at your interest and the interest of other peers, matches those, and then automatically schedules a, a Zoom meeting between the two of you for 30 minutes that coming Friday. And this is a way that people can build their professional networks. This is a way they can meet people they haven't met before. Um, and it has this matching algorithm that makes it super efficient, but it's also has an open-endedness to it that makes it really powerful for students to get what they need out of it because they can turn that conversation in any direction that they want. Um, so as we think about going online, rather than just thinking about putting a, a student in a virtual lecture hall, how do we help them build those lifelong relationships that led to me working for my college classmate, you know, decades later? And then when it comes to um, learning plus the application, one thing that COVID opens up for us is the possibility that the learner might be able to actually learn while they are engaged in, in a workplace or an internship. Um, people are opening up virtual internships around the country and making more possibilities open to work and learn at the same time. Um, there's, I think the core point I'm, I'm trying to, to make in this regard is if we go back to those, those principles and say, how do we do these things right and think less about how we do all the things that we used to do face-to-face -face online, we're gonna get further. And if we don't, then we're gonna get stuck in a situation where we're trying to bring over the climbing wall and bring over Greek life and, and all the things that make on-campus great and find ourselves stuck in either contraptions that look like birds or a blockbuster video store and never quite get to Netflix. Um, so I hope that um, as you go through the sessions today, you'll be able to bring this question in your mind of what are the fundamental relationships and how can we creatively engage those um, and move to not just um, what we were doing face-to-face, uh, -face, but really think about them fundamentally differently and how we can uh, reach that new world, the Netflix world of online learning.